Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Home Visiting Program for Underserved Families for Administrators. My name is Molly Meinbrus and I will be acting as moderator and host for today's webinar, which is a production of the National Health Care for the Homeless Council with support from the Re Health Resources and Services Administration, OSPH. This is a one-hour presentation with the last 10 minutes reserved for questions and answers. A selected number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Thank you for participating in this webinar. Today's session will focus on the New Mexico Home Visiting Program. Home visiting is a service provided to families to help foster healthy relationships between parents and children. Home visiting providers educate parents on prenatal infant and child development, assess parent well-being, and connect families with community resources to ensure that they are fully supported. While the New Mexico Home Visiting Program is designed for an array of families, home is broadly defined and services can be provided to even those families living on the streets, in shelters, in transitional housing, or doubled up with friends or family. The home visiting model meets families where they are and reduces barriers to families with limited resources. Today's webinar is the first presentation in a two-part series on the New Mexico Home Visiting Program. It is geared towards administrators who are interested in learning about the resources necessary to run this type of program. Our presenter today is Soledad Pilar Martinez. Soledad was born in Chile, South America, and her family immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1960s. Soledad received her master's degree in social work from St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, and has since studied with the Early Childhood Mental Health Training Institute in New Mexico. She is a licensed independent social worker through the New Mexico Social Work Board and a distinguished infant mental health mentor through the Michigan Association for Infant Mental Health. Soledad currently works for the State of New Mexico Children, Youth, and Families Department as Program Manager for New Mexico's Home Visiting Program and Program Manager for Early Childhood Mental Health Services. I will now let Soledad begin the presentation. Thank you, Soledad. Thanks, Molly. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, thank everybody for attending this webinar. I hope that it will be uh, useful for you to uh, to hear this. So let me start. Um, just a little overview, and I think that Molly did a good job in, in laying this out, but I just want to um, explain the overview. I'm going to go through uh, the developmental process that we um, have undertaken and uh, share the good, the bad, and the ugly, and um, hope that it's useful for your administrators. Um, we are continuing to build on our, um, on our structures, and we get a lot of this feedback from our um, program, uh, community program in, in New Mexico. So it's a collaborative process. Sorry, I have this phone that keeps ringing. Um, so uh, we are in the, uh, we are part of the Children's Youth and Families Department, Early Childhood Services or Division, and we're part of the Office of Child Development. This is important to mention to you because uh, as of a few years ago, we didn't have a, a Early Childhood Division, and uh, Early Childhood Services were uh, housed in different parts of the department, and um, which made uh, services to babies and infants difficult to uh, develop and implement. But now we have a home, so it makes uh, things much easier for us. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is to have a mission and vision that supports the work of the, of the home visiting. And these, uh, both of these concepts and both of these uh, um, uh, well, uh, structures that we developed were developed by the programs, the community program managers. And we sat together one, in one of our meetings and we uh, decided what it was that we wanted to do and how 
uh, we wanted to do it. So it wasn't the state of New Mexico uh, deciding what the mission for the program was going to be or what the vision was going to be. And in fact, I can tell you that um, some uh, internally to the department uh, had a little bit of a reaction when uh, we uh, uh, used the word love for generations to come because uh, uh, I think that we're still having a, uh, a reaction to when, when we talk about children being loved or people being loved. So uh, just a comment, commentary about that. But it was a very collaborative effort to, to define the mission and the vision for the program. Um, finding a good home is very important. As I mentioned to you uh, earlier, the, er, the children's services or early childhood services were, um, were placed all over the Children, Youth, and Families Department. And at the time that uh, home visiting were, was funded by the state of New Mexico, um, there were some decisions that were made that housed the program with a behavior health management um, entity. And of course, this uh, was not a very good home, and it created a, a, a situation where uh, it, prevention was not understood, and um, the work of home visiting was not understood, obviously. And uh, the entity uh, did not know what to do with this program. In fact, it didn't even uh, identify anyone to uh, provide a management for it. So when you think about where do you want to uh, find a place where home visiting can grow and can be understood and, understand, and people understand a continuum of incremental health services, that prevention is a piece of that services it's very, it becomes very critical as, as you move into development of programs. Uh, the other piece about finding a good home is that the people in leadership uh, position understand what these uh, concepts are. And uh, some of them, as you know, might be parallel process of reflective supervision, which I'm going to speak more about as we go into the webinar. Uh, the other piece that I think is important for um, administrators to think about is uh, how you, what you're going to fund. Is it going to be a universal home visiting program or is it going to be uh, targeted? And I think that um, it, uh, the difference is in terms of funding is that if you're going to fund a targeted approach or at risk children, then uh, some thinking needs to be made in terms of what the cost of that uh, service is going to be. Right now, the home visiting program uh, that is funded through general funds is a universal approach. And we target children under three. And one of the things that uh, you will see when we come to the logic model that there is a um, legend in the logic model that says that home may include schools or even jails, wherever the parent and child can be seen together and based on the specific needs of each particular family. And I'm just calling your attention to that because of the special population that uh, this webinar is addressing. And I know that uh, when we get together, we talk about the parent-child interaction being key and home visiting being a strategy as to where that's going to be, that service is going to be delivered. And so we do not talk about uh, what the home looks like, but where the child and the parent is, is found. So uh, we do have a universal approach. To children under three, there's no um, finance or economical economics that the family needs to meet. Um, we are 
we had a lot of thinking uh, in terms of how we were going to fund the program. And um, we started with an hourly um, reimbursement process. This that was not very useful for the providers. It constrained them in the services, and some families needed more than an hour, some families needed less than an hour. And so we um, learned by that, and we of course had a lot of feedback from the providers that they were not able to man manage a, a budget that was flexible and uh, that they could uh, deliver services in their community in the way that families needed. So we had to uh, do a different procurement, a different RFP. And by the way, this is the third RFP that we sent out in three years. The first was uh, to fund the program that was, uh, for uh, unknown reason up to me up to now, uh, why the, uh, the program went to behavioral health. So we sent an RFP for that. Then we, we, the program came back to the department. We sent another RFP. And then the, um, we had to reissue the RFP because of the feedback we received due to the funding. So uh, our providers had gone through quite a bit in terms of uh, commitment to, to the service. And they stuck with us, and they reapplied. So we are very pleased and proud that uh, we went through that process together and grew from it. At this point, we have a uh, funding that allows programs to manage their dollars, and it's based on $3,000 per family. Uh, we do keep track on the dosage so that um, it we're, we're targeting around $120 to $135 for, per hour. This is just a visit. It does not include prep time or um, travel or any of those administrative costs. So uh, we are going to go to um, this, this procurement is going to end in, um, in, in, in two years, this year and the following year. And, uh, the leadership is now thinking about readjusting some of these uh, funding methods and making it a combination of uh, dollars for families as well as uh, a number of dosage, but still allowing flexibility for the needs of the family. So we might have a family that needs one visit a month or maybe a couple of weeks, and others that need uh, more than two or two hours or uh, more, more often. So allowing for that flexibility. Now, um, I just wanted to, to say uh, before I move into this logic model that the state uh, is, the home visiting program that I manage is, is general funds or state dollars. Uh, we have federal dollars that fund um, the federal program, and um, the needs assessment um, was you know, conducted, and, and we are using two models that were um, in, you know, identified by the feds. So in one community, we're using nurse family partnership, and in a different community uh, in New Mexico, we're using uh, parents as teachers. Uh, what we've done in New Mexico is that we have communicated and talked with Nurse Family Partnership and um, parents as teachers, and we have uh, shared this logic model, and they have agreed that uh, they can um, support the logic model for their, uh, mo for their particular uh, models. But further, what we've done is, is when we get to the um, screening tools that we use here, they have agreed to um, make that part of um, their uh, service model for the New Mexico. So what it does is that it creates a seamless system of system for phone visiting. So there's not uh, you know, many models, but one uh, mod one home visiting program that houses different models in, in New Mexico. And that um, 
uh, are the nurse family partnership, the uh, parents with teachers, and an emerging model that um, that is called firstborn. Uh, that is almost going to be uh, evidence-based. Uh, Rand Corporation is doing the evaluation of that model. So let me uh, talk a little bit about this um, this logic model. Um, one of the things that we did with this is that it, it it we did not have it in the beginning of the of the uh, implementation of this program. Um, so it came late and I think that the federal um, requirements kind of pushed us to get to this. So I would just, I'm mentioning that because I think it's important for the administrators to think about this before you implement. But at the same time, we had um, input from the providers to develop this model. So it's, it's really how you're going to, uh, what kind of structures you want to have that is collaborative and cooperative and have this parallel process. So you see that uh, one, uh, the top of this logic model theoretical base, we are using attachment theory. And although we have um, the A study, the prevention of adverse childhood experiences, uh, the neurodevelopmental research, uh, we use mutual competence and family-centered relationship-based practice as foundational, we have decided in thinking through this and in meeting together with the leadership team, which is the professional development person, people, uh, and the um, database the folks, as well as our providers, that attachment theory really informs, attachment really informs everything we do. It informs brain development, and it informs uh, mutual competence, uh, and of course, how we how we talk about this is relationship based, which I think is a very um, comfortable approach here in New Mexico, because we are very relationship focused, uh, and uh, because of our um, Spanish um, history and in our Native American history, and um, and how that is. Um, developed uh, and implemented and, and uh, foundational here in New Mexico. Um, so um, one, just to mention some of the outcomes that we're, we're targeting. Now, it's interesting for me, I think, to tell you, or maybe it is interesting, I don't know if it'll be interesting, but one of the things that um, happened in New Mexico is that in, in 2007-2008, uh, we brought together uh, a number of stakeholders, and we developed um, a book, and, and you will find it in the resource, uh, the CYFD.org. It's called Building a System of Home Visiting in New Mexico, uh, the next three years from 2009 to, 2000, uh, 2009 to 2012. And at that point, we, we developed and came up with these long-term outcomes. And um, so we've had to, when we developed this logic model, we had to come up and go through and get to these long-term outcomes, which are fairly uh, expansive. And um, so we had a little bit of a challenge to get to these outcomes. However, uh, our screening tools that we use helped us to get there. But again, uh, we were doing this uh, in a way backwards, so we um, we had some challenges. Uh, but I think that uh, in essence what what we found is that when we looked at the federal guidelines uh, and what we were looking at as long-term outcomes, we were right on target. Um, so it um, it solidified our thinking, but uh, I think for administrators, it's useful to think about how you want to work outcomes, uh, short-term and long-term, and how those theor theoretical frames are going to support that, and how your screening tools that you use to to get to outcomes are, um, are supporting that, the outcomes. 
Now, um, I want to just remind you that in the logic models, we do not uh, uh, define home. And neither the, and our service definition manual, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, defines home. We just define that it's important to have a baby. And a home visit is with a baby. So um, let me move to this uh, slide in terms of evaluation. Now, another thing that we didn't do in New Mexico that I think is important for evaluators to, to, to think about and uh, make decisions is that we did not set aside dollars for an evaluation. We put all our dollars into services. And I think now, uh, because of the federal um, dollars that are coming to states, we are behind kind of the eight ball because uh, we're just getting to um, to talk about evaluation, and in fact, we're still kind of uh, I've been scraping some dollars to put uh, to to contract with uh, professors at UNM to do the beginning of this process. So it's important to think through about how you're going to fund an evaluation, and we know that evaluations are expensive if you are going to do it uh, the way that uh, is clean and, and has, the, uh, you know, um, the best approach to it. So I, at this point, um, we are struggling with this issue. Now, um, perhaps when we go to a new procurement, we will have uh, put aside those dollars to to develop this evaluation. In the meantime, we have a contract with um, a professor at UNM that is uh, going to develop um, uh, an evaluation design for us. So hopefully, we can begin to implement that. And of course, know what you will evaluate. Um, we have, you know, make it succinct, make it something that uh, we'll be able to give uh, legislatures and um, and your policymakers something that they will be able to grab onto quickly and not wait uh, you know for a longitudinal study to to get to those outcomes. Uh, of course, it's important to set up a database that is going to provide you that information. Uh, that is going to be evaluated. We have a rich, rich, rich database. And um, I think that sometimes uh, I wonder what, uh, if anything, uh, we can't um, make use of and uh, use for the evaluation or what um, might be extra work for the uh, home visitors to enter when we might not use it for an evaluation. So it's, it's a really important uh, process for, for administrators to consider um, when you're thinking about an evaluation. Um, and especially when the database that is going to be used is going to be one that is going to, the data is going to be entered by home visitors. So um, at this point, New Mexico is uh, going to be uh, thinking about how we want to proceed with this piece of um, what's important for us. Um, so let me begin a little bit about the program com com components that we have in home visiting and what has been useful for us. Um, I mentioned um, a few times the screening tools that we use, um, and we, we are using this to get to our outcomes in our logic model. Of course, we use uh, the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression. I know that there are other screens, but in New Mexico, this is a fairly well-known um, tool. We are tracking, um, and, and uh, we have information on uh, the number of women that are showing a positive screen. And of course, we, we refer them for services and follow up with them. Uh, we do do screen for partner violence with a women abuse screening tool. It's two questions, so it's very non-invasive. And uh, 
One thing I'd like to mention about this stool is that our home visitors have had um, a, a lot of uh, reaction and, and uh, um, discomfort to uh, to providing or to doing the screens. We've had to do a lot of talking about it and training on it. And, and in fact, we're going to um, do a con conference this uh, spring with the Domestic Violence um, Coalition and other early childhood people to talk about domestic violence and the, bring these two fields and these two worlds together so that there's more comfort in, um, in this area. Uh, I think we're still in process with that, and um, hopefully, as we joined um, our efforts, we can become more comfortable and in sharing information about the importance of early detection in terms of this and early child development. Of course, you probably are familiar with the Ages and Stages questionnaire, and we also use the Ages and Stages social emotional. Uh, we have um, a periodicity table, and you can look at this, the periodicity of these tools in our service definition manual that are on our website. But uh, along with this, um, you know, the ages and stages is uh, it's delivered very, pretty often, and uh, our feedback from our providers was, you know, we're doing this and. You know, we don't have to do this this often. So we got together uh, in one of our quarterly meetings, and uh, we developed the uh, periodicity that worked for providers. Um, the ages and stages we did not um, change in terms of periodicity because it wasn't that often. But all of these uh, screen tools periodicity was, uh, were uh, identified and decided by our providers. We really try to implement a parallel process where people feel that they have ownership and, and uh, a part of the decision making rather than state coming in um, deciding what uh, worked best for, each, for communities. Um, we have the knowledge of infant development. And this is a, a, a very large and, and um, uh, many items in this um, in this tool. We did uh, we did shorten it to about 14 items that um, measure or identify uh, the parents' knowledge of infant development. We are increasing its uh, periodicity. Uh, because we uh, found that it could be used throughout um, infancy as well as uh, when the child goes into toddlerhood. So we're increasing that period as it do to measure and to understand how the parents' knowledge of infant development is growing and is becoming more sophisticated and what impact <coughs> excuse me, we are having with that. We find that the social support index is very critical. We're very rural in New Mexico and a very frontier state and many of our, you know, we, we're we very, uh, population is not um, dense at all. So we really want to get a handle of the social support that families have, and particularly the caregiver, so that we can work with and strengthen a formal and informal support um, and identify what's there for those folks and how well uh, they are feeling um, um, as part of their community. We have um, a great many immigrant uh, folks from different parts of the world, so we want to get a sense of uh, their uh, sense of um, community. We know that isolation is a uh, hammer of uh, abuse and neglect for our babies and children, so we pay close attention to this index. And then we borrowed uh, from our uh, sister agency in New Mexico, Human Services Department, uh, New Mexico Medical Assistance Division, a developmental guidance. And the developmental guidance that they have really talks about and identifies environmental issues, uh, not 
it does not identify uh, psychological or um, in social emotional issues. So we really use this to guide the home visitors in terms of environmental um, aspects of uh, the home or um, other environment, environmental uh, pieces that are important for home visits to, to um, deal with with the uh, caregiver. Now, uh, one of the key components, and you probably saw that in the logic model, is our reflective uh, practice. We, uh, this is part of the contract that we have with all providers, and it's a contract that the managers, including myself, have uh, with, um, with the providers. So as part of uh, the contract, um, they, uh, the managers need to meet with their staff at least once a week individually to uh, provide uh, reflective supervision, as well as field supervision and administrative supervision. And I mention this because um, what we found is that at one, and we suggested that they be uh, two separate processes or two separate uh, by done by two separate people, or if done by the same person, um, say the manager, that'd be at different times. What we're finding now, um, because of our feedback and the conversations we have with providers, is that um, it is useful to do it uh, by one, useful to, to be done by one person, say the manager, and to blend um, the reflective process with the administrative process so that they can be supported if they're done in a way that is non-punitive and collaborative and um, that the uh, program manager that's doing the reflective supervision has those kinds of skills to um, bring forward those, those pieces that, <coughs> excuse me, activate uh, a home visitor by uh, something that is internal to them. <coughs> How we do this is that we have a contract with University of New Mexico Center for Development and Disability to, and uh, with um, uh, about uh, three of their staff people that are highly trained and have uh, our infant mental health endorsed. And they, um, we separated um, and, and identified different uh, groupings for them to provide reflective supervision for. These are the managers of the community programs. So as part of that, uh, they receive articles. Uh, this year, we are focusing on attachments. So all the articles that are sent are uh, to stimulate that thinking and how that uh, theoretical phase or that process is being implemented by them and their staff and to create more of a conversation with their home visitors. As I said, we have several groups. Uh, we we caused us uh, kind of a ruckus this year, or last year actually, when we um, reworked the groups and people did not find that to be helpful. But I think that in the long run it was helpful because we we, we mixed uh, folks that were new to the process, new to the work with uh, more sophisticated folks that really helped them to step up and understand and conversations that were rich uh, rather than just put the newbies together and the the all sophisticated program manager in one group. What we found is that the database provided a really good uh, report to go through some reflection with the, with the uh, staff. The program managers have reported this. Um, and uh, this was a surprise to me, but again, uh, something to share with you and uh, administrators that the database is not just a means to get uh, numbers and uh, to get the outcomes and 
but it it is uh, how your uh, how you think about it, how your programs think about it, and we have found it that to be a really useful um, way to get to reflection. And as an example, I can tell you that uh, one of our managers was talking about how uh, home visitors was always talking and, and identifying one uh, activity and, um, and not identifying other activities that um, are um, possible choices, which led to some discussion about why these things were not being touched on. So again, uh, just uh, being creative on how you use your database. Also, we are very aware that reflective supervision has increased retention. We have very little, um, you know, change of, of uh, and, um, uh, home visitors uh, leaving the program, so program managers leaving the program. There's just a couple of programs that have gone through uh, some, some of these um, changes, but it really has helped to retain uh, home visitors as well as program managers. Again, us as administrative staff, uh, which as I mentioned to you, uh, identified as myself as a state program manager, as well as our uh, partners at the Center for Development and Disability and our UNM partners that housed our database, we, compromi we comprised the administrative staff. Now we have a contract with our uh, an outside source, a national um, person in infant mental health that provides our um, reflective supervision. And then again, it, it helps with relationship and community in, our, uh, in building our home visiting community. Um, very critical piece, and I encourage you to make it a part of your work. We have uh, a large uh, amount of dollars invested in our professional development for our um, providers, and it's very thoughtful. Um, we have a prioritized our training, and I know that in initially our first year, we really prioritized our training and our uh, communications to deal with database uh, training on how to how to gather the data, training on uh, on the database themselves. Um, at this point, we have gone from training. Last year, we really focused on moving from a case management approach to a parent-child interaction approach. But again, it is a developmental process that we are going through. And at this point, we're building on our sophistication over time in terms of how we approach our uh, trainings and how we develop these trainings. A lot of the trainings are online trainings because we are rural, we are uh, um, frontier states, so it really helps for providers to have this as a means to train their staff. And uh, it's also important to understand where programs are developmentally, so they gear their, we gear our, pro, our trainings to help them grow in this sophistication. Um, and uh, I, I'm very pleased with how we are growing that in New Mexico. Some of the communication structures uh, that we have developed is, of course, our site reviews. And I really take a technical assistant approach rather than let me find what's wrong with your program, but what do you need to get more sophisticated in the work that we do. Um, we have asked the manager, we have monthly uh, calls to provide from providers and to ask questions to, to build community. We have quarterly meetings and our quarterly reports, which I read and give feedback on and are very, very interesting. And of course, I'm very available and, and uh, answer emails and, and questions readily, uh, which I understand is exceptional for state government. So just uh, it, it's really how we build community. Our uh, target population is three, age, uh, zero to three prenatal and a universal, and some at risk with uh, targeting teens. Uh, we have specific work with prenatal and infant and toddlers. 
Uh, so our, our scope of work clearly defines that. Um, we do ask providers to use an evidence base. We uh, uh, we uh, recommended a curriculum, but we do ask them to do document uh, the use of the curriculum and, if needed, to supplement with other curriculums that are appropriate for their community. So you can see we are very flexible. And our service definition manual is updated annually with program uh, community providers input. It's their manual, so uh, you can find that on our website. Uh, as, as you can see, we have a very um, collaborative approach to our site visit. And I share all the findings. I meet with staff at the beginning and at the end. And I share all the findings with all staff rather than just the program manager. So everybody's included. Um, this is a map of where we are in New Mexico. You will see that we have a, um, a different kind of icon in Santa Fe. We have infant mental health. And this is an infant mental health team that deals with babies in care, in our foster care. And uh, we use the uh, two-lane model. And you can see that our uh, outcomes is to reduce time in foster care and provide uh, permanency for babies uh, that are in foster care. We are in the process of uh, developing another team in uh, Las Cruces. Uh, that's in Doña Ana County, in the southern part of the state. Uh, we're in the process of contract negotiation and some of the measures we use to get to understanding that uh, that baby and that caregiver. Uh, again, a little bit more about that. And the database uh, that we're using was developed uh, for us. And um, as again, as I said, it's used by the state and the federally funded programs. Uh, and the uses include the program managers federally, the federal program manager and myself, the data uh, analyst, and all program um, managers out there um, in communities. Uh, a little bit about, and you can see this, I know that we're running out of time a little bit, but uh, the data management workflow. And, uh, and then uh, and this is uh, done the cleaning and the uh, um, support is done by our uh, UNM partner. And, and this is a, we, we have an Im incredible person who was a home visitor, so understands the service and uh, understands the data, uh, the importance of data. And, and it's just a terrific person. She's so available and adjusts uh, the database to the needs of the program. Uh, I have access, uh, the University of New Mexico has access, and everybody gets the, uh, an ID to enter data. Um, program Community programs have uh, reports that they can uh, access and understand the data. We also have reports that we can send to pediatricians in terms of ages and stages, questionnaire if they're below baseline, or any of the reports. And one of the things I mentioned is that the uh, developer of the, our database is Gary Cameron at SimServe. So if you're interested, uh, I can give you that information. Some of the resources that you can look at is our uh, CYFD.org. The uh, person that is the division director at the Center for Development of Disabilities, Maddie Perdison. And uh, Elena Sher is our um, partner at uh, UNM that deals with that database. And I also gave you Deborah Harris, who is our director of our infant team here in New Mexico. So um, that ends my presentation. And I'll pass the mic to Molly for questions. Thank you, Soledad. Uh, I will now begin the Q&A session. Uh, we have a couple questions now, and if anyone else has questions, please send them in. Uh, the first question, Soledad, is 
from Bernie, and she would like to know if there's a link to the tools that you all modified, and I believe those are the screening and assessment tools. Um, yes, there is a link. At, uh, I believe they're in the service definition manual that you can find in our website, uh, cyfd.org, and then go to Early Childhood Services, Home Visiting, and they, you will find all that information on the right hand, bottom right-hand side. If you want uh, more information, just email me and we can talk more about it. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question asks what the ratio of program managers to outreach workers and the, also the ratio of outreach workers to clients are. We have um, 16 programs. Each of them has a program manager. The uh, number of uh, home visitors to the program may vary according to the community and according to the funding. So um, if you want to know how many home visitors we have in New Mexico, I can um, email you that information. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but each one of the sites has a uh, program manager. I hope that um, I hope that kind of answers your question. Ollie? Thank you, Soledad. Um, uh, there is one more question, and it's regarding funding. So um, I think you, you touched on some of this, but what do you think will be challenges in sustaining this um, home visiting program? Uh, you know, it's interesting. In New Mexico, uh, like the rest of the state, obviously, we have gone through um, some, um, you know, financial crisis. Uh, and it's interesting that home visiting dollars were not touched while all other dollars in many of the programs uh, were touched, and some of them um, majorly. But in... <laughs> The last legislative session, we got a little bit of a bump. Uh, my understanding, this next session, which starts in January, uh, we uh, it's, it is um, predicted, um, but one never knows, that we're going to get uh, additional home visiting state dollars. Um, federally, we got the federal dollars, and we also got uh, we also received and were awarded uh, supplemental. So we are, um, in home visiting, we have a pretty good foundation for prevention programs. Our challenge now is to really look at these dollars and help legislators understand that home visiting is a strategy and try to build an infant mental health continuum uh, with prevention, uh, intervention, and then treatment. So that is our um, vision and our goal in New Mexico. I uh, hope that gets to your question. Uh, something else? Yes, thank you, Soledad. Uh, we have another question asking if this type of program is operational in other states. Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, I don't think so. I don't know if anybody has looked at our RFP or our scope of work. Um, but my thinking is the activities that we request in the contract and in the RFP are pretty much fundamental, fundamental uh, services that I think any home visiting, including the, the models that are identified by the feds. So um, to answer uh, in a succinct way, no, I don't think so, no. Thank you. <clears throat> um, someone is asking how large the budget is for this program. Right now, our budget is about $2 million uh, sum. 
and um, uh, um, majority of, of that goes to services, and again, some of it goes to professional development and our um, infant team uh, and our database. So again, a majority of that goes to directly to services. And I think our last question for today is what is your or what is the home visiting program's relationship like with local schools if, if, if you do have a relationship? Yes, I think uh, at this point um, our relationship with schools may be one where they're um, we're trying to uh, engage the schools where young people might be um, might be parents or might be um, uh, expecting. So we, we um, develop relationship wherever um, babies might be um, uh, coming, and that means school. However, I think that those relationships might become more of a foundational because we do have parents as teachers, and, and those programs are embedded in schools. So our relationship with schools, I think, are going to be uh, broader uh, as the years go, go, go on. Oh, thank you so much, Soledad. I, I believe that was our last question. Um, so uh, that will end our Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for joining the Home Visiting Program. Uh, for Underserved Families for Administrators webinar produced by the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. We invite you all to visit the National Health Care for the Homeless Council website for a full listing of our upcoming and archived council webinars as well as other educational opportunities. And I'd like to thank the presenter and the attendees once again. And this meeting is now closed.